My name is uh, Dennis Evans. I uh, uh, was born and raised in St. Thomas during the busy times of the railroad. I, uh, as a young boy, I always wanted to work on the railroad. Every, all my neighbors worked on either the New York Central Railway or or the CNO Railway, uh, the Wabash Railway, or, or I worked for the CNR Railway, and uh, uh, I hired with the CNR Railway as a trainman on August the 25th, 1964, and I retired as a train conductor in October the 1st of 1996, that's uh, 32 years seniority. And uh, I saw a lot of changes in the railroad, whether it be uh, St. Thomas or uh, the CNR in, in London. Uh, I, I did work jobs in St. Thomas during my railroad career. The CNR worked out of the same station as the Norfolk Southern Wabash. I like to refer to it as the Wabash, or the old names of the trains or the companies. And uh, I guess you sometimes you start when you're a little kid living in the city of St. Thomas. And uh, as a little boy, we lived on Chestnut Street. And I would say uh, one third of all my neighbors on Chestnut Street work on the railroad in one capacity or another. We had uh, a machinist uh, who worked on the CNO. I, uh, beside me, there was a uh, blacksmith who uh, worked on the New York Central. My father worked on the New York Central. Uh, the fellow across the road from us was an engineer on the New York Central. The fellow beside him a couple doors down was a conductor on the CNO Railway. The fellow that lived behind us was an electrician on the New York Central Railway. So and on and on and on, just in our neighborhood. And uh, as a little guy, you kind of looked up to these people. They're always busy, they're always going to work on the railroad, and it seemed like it's life was good. Okay, my name is William Lawrence, and I uh, hired on the New York Central Railway in uh, 1951, and I they used the railway at that time, or I guess still do, I would hire the high school students and university students for three or four months in the summer. And then after three or four months, they'd go back to school. And, and uh, But anyway, you get four, three or four months of work out of it, which was well paid at the time. Well, I lived over there on 43 Jonah Street, or 41 Jonah Street, where the sports club is now, was where I was born and raised. My father worked on a on the Michigan Central, uh, he hired on in '52 in 1922, and he worked for 40 years. And anyway, through him, I might have got the job in the summertime because I was pretty young. I decided I wanted to be on the train crews because I had an uncle and a cousin and whatever worked on the Wabash Railroad. So I went over there and applied for a job in 1953 as a trainman or a brakeman and it, eventually they, they hired me. Then I went to work in 54, regular on the Wabash. And I worked up in, uh, you know, I worked in 1954 to 1960 as on the train crews. Most of the time, or a lot of the times, down on Niagara Falls in the swing job, run from Niagara Falls in the Fort Erie back and forth. It worked seven days a week 365 days a week, or a year. No days off, believe it or not. Norfolk and, yeah, I guess it was Norfolk and Western bought the Wabash, and they tripled, they doubled the size of the trains and laid half of the men off, which I was one. So then we trans, the guys that laid off, we had railroad experience, we swung right over onto the CNR because they were qualified men to go to work. So we went, and we, done the same thing with CNR, wrote the rules and whatever. We went to work in the CNR, uh, and I worked in the CNR from 1960 until 19, 1993. So 
total time on, I worked on the railroad for roughly 41 years. And then after I retired from the, uh, the railroad, then I went over to the museum and helped them with the museum. And I think I spent more time or more hours and done more work for the museum than I did when I got paid when I worked for the railroad. The number nine come, but number nine is in at least, I don't know, 100 or more pieces. It's unbelievable. And I looked at it and I said, there's no way this thing will ever be put together again. So we put it in the shop and it, and it took, and there's maybe we got a dozen guys working on it. And it took us four and a half years to put that thing together. And a lot of what was wore out, we had somebody, got somebody to make a new one. And uh, four and a half years later, we run it, steamed it up, run it outside the door. And uh, we run it around a little bit. And finally, after we had the thing running perfect, we got to board a transport to come down and they certified it because everything was certified that you could run it. It was safe to operate. So then after that, we had three or four coaches that the Restoration Society had, passenger coaches, and we used to take a hook onto that engine with the permission of the, of the Conrail, and we'd run it up on the Conrail main line down to the end of the city where the bridge was on Sunset Drive and back here. We'd run that on maybe on once, two or three times a month in the summer for on a Sunday, you know, and, and it, it, like I say, we worked on that thing four and five days a week, six or eight hours a day, and it took us literally four and a half hours, four and a half years, and we finally got it, painted it, and we it re literally rebuilt the whole thing. And when we got done with it, it looked like, it looked like and operated like a brand new engine. We, and it was all volunteers, all retired railroad men. We had a fantastic time with it. My father used to drive me to Fort Stanley, and I rode the LMPS to St. Thomas, and from there I walked to where Stacy I used to be, up on Pearl Street. And you walked whether it was raining or shining or whatever. When I finished business college in St. Thomas, I naturally wanted to find a job. And that was where I went to work, in the office of the CN Wabash. And I wish my memory was as statistically brainy as it used to be. Well, I didn't operate a locomotive. I used to, uh, I did book work. And there were a lot of tra different train companies operated in St. Thomas. The uh, New York Central came into course over at the Michigan tracks and the uh, Per Marquette was in and the CN Wabash. St. Thomas was more affected by railways than anything else, isn't that right? I'm going back now in the 60s, so I'm going back to the 60s, early 70s. Those trains, they would call you uh, Buffalo via Suspension Bridge. That meant you were going to go, once you got to, Nag or to Welland, the tracks veered off to the left, and you went through Niagara Falls, Canada, Niagara Falls, New York, set off in the New York Central Yard, later Penn Central Yard, later Conrail Yard. But that's where you set your cars off and also picked up there maybe too. Then you went on into Buffalo. That was a longer route. The other route when they called you was Buffalo via the Rock. You went through Fort Erie, Ontario into Black Rock. And that was a little shorter route. You didn't really have any set-offs. When you went through the Rock, you just went right with your Buffalo stuff right into Buffalo. There was no going through Niagara Falls. and So there was two different routes and it, the tracks separated at Welland. One went through Niagara Falls, the other went straight through into Fort Erie, and then Black Rock and on in. Well, the cab sits out over the side of the rail a little bit, and there's no handrail on that side. There was a handrail on the, on the left side. You could walk across. 
beside the other track, but we're on the eastbound track, and the cab sat out a ways, of course. You could look straight out that window down, right down to the gorge. You could straight out, there was nothing there. You looked out that window, there was nothing there. People that worked in, say, St. Thomas and, and worked at a job where we went to work nine to five job or even shift work, you didn't get to experience some of the things we saw because we were, you know, in Detroit and Buffalo and all over the country and we saw a lot of different things. That's one thing about the job. It also took us away from our families a lot too. I spent a lot of time away from my kids when they were younger. My son was playing hockey, so my wife, she was great. She, uh, she was really good. She took over and did a lot of that stuff, you know. But uh, I went everything I could when I was home. But it was a good job, but it was also a job that um, you certainly if uh, there was a lot of things that, uh, oh, I don't know. I'm Charles Beckett from St. Thomas area. And in my early days, uh, I worked for the County of Elgin when I got done high school, finished grade 13. And I decided there's more to life than this manual labor for the County of Elgin at 65 cents an hour. So I found out that the telegraphers on this railway system here in town, whoever you work for, were getting a dollar and a quarter an hour. That seemed like a wonderful opportunity for me to do well. So I applied at the New York Central Railway at the Canada Southern Station, known as the Michigan Central Depot in my day, and uh, applied there for a job as a telegrapher. And the reason I chose that was because I'd already learned telegraphy in the Army cadets when I was 16. So here I was 18 and now wanting a job on the railway. And they said, sorry, this is uh, October, and we won't be using any spare telegraphers until next spring. If you want to hire on then, you'll have to pass the wire test for the Morse telegraph, American Morse code, uh, by the spring. And I said, well, I already got Morse code. And they said, no, you've got uh, international, and we have a different code. And you'll have to learn that over the winter and pass to get on in the spring to start your career. So I went out. Uh, they said, you go out to see the agent in Shedden, and so I went out to see Vince Burry, the uh, NYC agent at Shedden, Ontario. There was two stations in Shedden, and wouldn't you know it, I went to the wrong one. I went to the Chesapeake in Ohio, or PM, I believe, Paramarquette it was called then, in, in the 50s, in 1951, in the fall there, and was directed over to the right one, the New York Central, where Vince Burry was, and found Vince. And he said, yep, for a certain sum, uh, princely some, I thought at the time, but anyway, I had, he would teach me for two months and get me up to speed on railroad American Morse telegraphy. And in the spring, I went back to the railway by arrangement and passed the, the Morse code test around the 12th of, of May in 1952. And I got my 20 words a minute. So on May the 22nd, 1952, I was at work on the railway at a non-telegraph location called E and O Crossing. That's an interlocker down near Welland, Ontario. And I, that's how I got started. I'm Edith Jacqueline and I used to be a Rickman till I married my husband in 1946. And I used to live on a farm which was called the Pontsford Farm. And that's a name that's in town that people know of. But uh, we used to go down over Farley Hill and around the hill and up into that farm. And at the same time, the railroad ran through that farm. So that in the first place, the railroad was part of our life because we had to be careful we didn't go across the fences and get in, uh, get in front of the train. <laughs> My brother actually did at one time. Not in front of the train, but he laid down on that bridge going across toward Pinafore Park uh, at the side of the train while it went by because he wasn't supposed to be on that bridge. But we used it all the time. There were five, five or six of us all the time, plus the neighbors that used to take that train. But we'd make sure there was no train coming. So trains are, that goes back till I was 10. <laughs> Actually, it, I was, uh, believe it or not, hit by, the car was hit by a train 
uh, I was taking my youngest daughter over to Locke School and without thinking I drove up on the tracks and the train just pushed us down almost to Hiawatha Street. Uh, not tipping over, but squishing in from my daughter's side. But that morning, her I couldn't get her seatbelt fixed for some reason on. And she said, I'm going to be late, I'm going to be late. The way she went, and she dashed over or got pushed over onto my side, okay, and I held her like this, but I had my seat belt on, and we came to a stop looking at the engine. Hey, I'm uh, Cliff Chaplow. Uh, I'm a founding member of the Elgin County Railway Museum. Uh, I have no personal railway experience myself, but my father and all my uncles worked on the railway. Uh, the museum basically got started in my barber shop just through a conversation with a friend of mine who uh, no longer lives in St. Thomas but lives in Iroquois, Ontario. And uh, I was telling him that uh, they had a couple efforts to acquire an engine to put with Jumbo, but uh, it never worked out. And uh, I think there was about two months went by and Don called me and he said, I've got an engine for St. Thomas if they're interested in it. And it was at Upper Canada Village uh, in Morrisburg. And so I went down and talked to the curator and looked it all over and, and I come back and uh, approached the member of the city council. And I got into a uh, meeting in camera after the regular council sessions and made my presentation uh, the city council liked what they heard, I guess, and they appointed Morris Baudry and myself as a committee to investigate it further. Uh, they empowered us to uh, add two more members to the committee. Uh, Morris added Don Broadbear and I added John Parsons. And we took off for Morrisburg and uh, they Everybody was excited about it. It was a steam locomotive and two rolling stock units. One was a passenger coach complete with gas lighting and the other one was a uh, two-piece equipment. It was a baggage car on one end and a refrigerator car on the other. Uh, and so we uh, came back to city council with our findings and uh, Unfortunately, the word got out down in the Morrisburg area and the committee from down there showed up and they told the curator of Upper Canada Village that they'd be willing to uh, restore and clean up the equipment that was there if they would leave it in Morrisburg. And so the city lost out. But uh, in the process, we also found out that uh, the Museum of Science and Technology in Ottawa were disposing of or dispersing uh, four locomotives. Uh, three of them are owned by the Museum of Science and Tech and the fourth one was owned by CN Rail. Uh, I had approached John Wise when we, he was our Honorable John Wise, he was uh, our Minister of Agriculture for Canada and uh, he had sent his aide down to Morrisburg to secure the uh, equipment we'd found there. And uh, when we moved on to Ottawa, uh, again, I contacted him and uh, he had better connections with the CN or the president of the CN than he did with the museum people. And so he negotiated and uh, acquired the 5700 engine uh, for St. Thomas and Elgin County. All right, my uh, name is John Brian Gold, and actually most people call me Jack. And um, in 1967, I commenced work with the Norfolk and Western Railway at that time, and since come, become the Norfolk Southern, as the chief clerk. 
Um, I started, actually physically started work in the latter part of August of 1967 and my seniority date was October the 1st. So I actually worked for a month or two, almost a month and a half before I actually got paid by the railway. There was uh, two gentlemen that were in the office at the time. The guy that I took over from was a guy by the name of Bill Cooper and he was the chief clerk at the time and there was also a storekeeper there George Berry was his name and um, when George and Bill both retired I ended up doing both their jobs and also uh, looking after the approval of time reports and so on with uh, all of the train and engine crews that were running on the Norfolk and Western at the time um, there were at that time there was roughly I think 70 people there in the six in 67 and when I retired in 2003 we had 32 left all right uh, my name is Rick Hodges I'm a lifetime resident of St. Thomas ex except for a few a uh, few years that I ended up in Simcoe in that area um, I was working I got hired on at the uh, by the Canadian National Railway uh, out of St. Thomas and uh, the reason I was looking for a job uh, I just worked at Clark Equipment and I just went through the big layoff there and uh, I came and applied for a job on the railroad um, and they said well we have an opening and it was sort of funny why they had an opening uh, out in the uh, they call it the Talbot Yard out at the Ford plant um, used to clean switches and it was in the middle of winter and uh, it became one short because a fellow was uh, actually was, was uh, killed out there uh, shoveling switches um, it was like a cold winter night and um, they were supposed to do two people to a switch one look east and one look left because they were always shunting and it was cold and free and they wanted to get warm so they each took uh, a different uh, um, switch and they were cleaning out and one of the cars came down with they shoved one of the cars down and it, it uh, ran over the guy so that's one that's how I ended up on my railway career I, we had to inspect the rail every day um, I, I did do that for a while a couple years with a fella from Cortland uh, an old-timer called L.V. Wilkinson uh, he was a part-time beekeeper and he was right beside the tracks in uh, Cortland and, and uh, yeah, him and me uh, he's sort of my mentor and I took a position as of um, assistant foreman in the Simcoe yard which is all the same division uh, and the territory ran from <clears throat> Jarvis Ontario to uh, Tilsonburg and uh, I worked under a fellow named Paul Zapaninskis um, he was a section foreman down there and I'd been on as assistant down there for two weeks and uh, one morning I uh, came into the yard uh, it happened to be the time when the uh, Norfolk Southern big train wreck was down there in 70 I think it was 75 where, where the engine of uh, two fellows from St. Thomas were uh, killed on it uh, um, and uh, it was I come into the yard and I said oh look there's uh, must have been an accident here by the subway because it was an overpass uh, the, the rail yard was on top of the overpass I said uh, they uh, a lot of fire trucks in that there so I pulled in the yard where I usually park my van and, and here there was a rail car sitting straight up and there was a Ford truck hanging dangling on chains right there and I went, oh Mac there's been a train wreck and uh, it had come right through the yard took all five sets of uh, tracks out um, uh, what had happened the engine part of the um, undercarriage of one of the engines uh, broke off in a switch in a frog and uh, derailed the train and it went sideways down through there if it would have happened if it would have been a half an hour later we all would have been in the shanty uh, getting the morning like it was just before I was the first one on the scene on the, from the railroad and um, we all would have been in the shanty and the, and the one whole wall was tore right off the shanty from the engine so it was uh, I was uh, I guess we we're pretty lucky my name my name is Roger Catchwall 
And my father was a mechanical blacksmith at the New York Central Shops. And that was my first exposure to the railroad. Quite often during my came, when I came home from school at noon, my mother would say, you have to take your dad's lunch over to the shops because he's got his furnace going and he can't leave his work. So I'd bring my, first, my lunch over for my dad. And as soon as I walked into the blacksmith shop, the first thing they'd ask me if I had a penny. So I'd say, no, well, no. So they'd give me a penny. Then they'd put it under the big steam hammer. And wham, bang down, the penny would come out about this big around. I never kept any of them, but it happened maybe seven or eight times. My dad ran the forging machines in the New York Central shops there. And his furnace would take a cube of steel or cast iron, whichever they were working with, roughly a 12 inch cube, like a sugar cube, only 12 by 12 by 12. And they would take it out with a crane and put it in the forging machine and he'd play it like somebody would play a piano or an organ with all the treadles and the, everything. It'd go wham, bang, bang, and out would come apart, which would go from there to the machine shop. So that was my first exposure to the railroad. My second one was in 1941, when they running, needed help on the New York Central right away with track repair. So I asked the school schools if anyone was interested, they could come over. So I volunteered for that, and I worked maintenance away from 1941 until I went in the Army in 1943. Well, we were in communication all the time about the trains coming. So they said, let us know that there was a freight train coming, so we all got back next to the fence. And we were standing beside a fence post, and the freight train went by. And all of a sudden, the next fence post just disappeared. What happened was that one of the brake shoes on the locomotive had fallen off, hit the drive rod, shot across, hit that that fence post, and just cleaned it right off. If it had been what part of probably killed us. Uh, my name's Ken Cook. I uh, currently live in St. Thomas. I'm a recent returnee. Uh, I lived here back in the '60s and worked here. And uh, I guess it was 1965 when we had the Great Northeastern Power Grid uh, failure. I was working at Timkins, and that was in November. And uh, my car blew up at the same time, and I was trying to get a ride home to Simcoe for Christmas. And I was uh, advised that maybe I could take the train from St. Thomas, which I reluctantly did. <laughs> um, this train apparently came out of Chicago, and it was just, like I said, just before Christmas. It was a really bad storm, and the train was about three hours late getting into St. Thomas here. And when it came in, I have never seen a train with so much snow packed under it and on top of it in my life. You couldn't see the trucks or the wheels on this train. And I had purchased a ticket to uh, Waterford, Ontario, which was the closest stop to Simcoe. Uh, when I got on the train, no problem. I sat down, the conductor finally came along and asked for my ticket. When I handed him my ticket, he uh, was not very pleased. In fact, he, he, he spoke uh, an expletive out loud and uh, explained to me that now he had to stop the train in Waterford because it was a flag stop. And at that time, it wasn't a regular stop, but if you purchased a ticket, they had to stop the train. So the train proceeded on to Waterford. We got to Elmer West. They had to stop there for an hour because of snow at the intersection on the road going into Elmer. And finally, we got to Waterford, and it was pretty bad weather, and uh, he overshot the station at Waterford by about five city blocks. Now he's really upset with me. He's on the radio trying to get in touch with the engineer, obviously, to back the train up, and I said, just relax, no problem. The Syracuse Hotel is like 200 yards away right there. Open the door, throw down the thing, let me out, and I'll be gone. He was quite happy to do that. So that was my uh, wonderful experience on the train. <laughs> Well, I'm Ron Vashon, and I just got, I started about 1967 as a, an operator, telegrapher. I just, somebody talked me into trying it out, so I did. And then I trained at the old Wabash station upstairs, and that's where they, uh, that's where the dispatchers used to be. Well, telegrapher, we were, we sold tickets in the station. We did uh, everything in the station. 
you know, you just look at your, your train orders. But we didn't use the key much because it was just fading out then when I hired on. We, we, they went down to the phones and then didn't need them anymore. But uh, it was a good life. I worked from Windsor to Burlington to Armstrong. I was in Armstrong for two months. I remember as a kid in the Holy Angel schoolyard that the engines shunting back and forth, switching cars, and the cinders are coming down on you in the schoolyard and everything else. But that's how I remember the railroad. We had a lot of railroad here, you know. See all the guys walking to work with their basket, away they go. But we never spent any time at home with God. Or I was all over the country. My wife hardly ever saw me. So then I got onto the, here in St. Thomas working as an operator. We called crews too. Eh? We had to get guys out of bed at night, which wasn't pleasant. Some of them, they're pretty miserable old people. But uh, we, uh, I did that, and then I, the train master here said, well, if you want to get on the running train, I'm going to hire about four guys. So I said, sure. So I took the train. Back then we had five men on the, on the train. Eh? Three in the engine, two in the caboose. And I was a fireman when I hired on, as a, on the running train too. But then I wasn't really a fireman. I never stoked an engine. I just sat, sat there and learned how to do it. <laughs> At the end, I had one guy in the engine, in the engine with me, just a conductor and me. But we used to have uh, like four trains a day out of here one time, in and out. And they ran some unit trains out of the Ford plant. And it was all autos. I remember taking those, a couple of those trains, about 120 cars. Oh. That was scary going down the Hamilton Mountain, I'll tell you. <laughs> you had to have your brakes on all the time going down through there. Because when I retired, they gave me a plaque with my, well, what's thing on it, and it was Rocket Ronnie, because I used to like to let him run. <laughs> if I'm going get to get there, I'm going to let him go, because if I had the power. Gord Horton, uh, St. Thomas. And uh, I, my connection with the railroad was uh, the holiday time. Well, it was quite the deal. They had a lot of a lot of American people come down on Friday night to to Port Stanley, and they used to drive these big motor homes and stuff up the top of the hill and camp up there. And it was it was something to see. You know, well, my brother and two sisters and myself went on went on the trip, and it was mind it was just to, just to uh, Port Stanley, but it really opened your eyes to how far how, how far things are so we we uh, had had a great time with with traveling on the friday night we take a picnic lunch and it uh, it, was, it just it became a great weekend okay my name is don hubert i finished high school in june of 44 and I was playing ball, and I was looking for a job, and I heard they were going to hire on the brakeman on the New York Central. Well, and over there, the New York Central, and they had finished hirings. So I was playing baseball, and I knew Leroy Bins, and he'd just hired on the CNO. So I went out to the CNO, which was the Pier Marquette at this time. So I got hired on to the so I said, Pier, Pier Marquette in J July 20th was when my seniority date started. And it was a steam engine day, so then the brakeman looks at the, with your on the tail end, what, what you call the caboose, or the head end. On the head end, you, you went to the service track after you booked in at, in St. Thomas and checked in. You went to the service track and got the engine and took it to, picked up at that time, you had your own caboose from there to Talbot Yard and put it on the train and then the brakeman would throw switches and put the engine on the head end of the cars or the head end of the train. You had to have your wits about you and keep a safe distance from moving trains and box cars and tanks cars. Usually the brakesman's job, you were, you were at the other end of the caboose from where the stove was. In the wintertime, well, lots of times you'd wake up and there'd be snow 
right beside you, come in through the window, there's snow on the floor or blow under the door. So you get up in the morning after the call boy had, had come and knocked on the caboose door, you're called for four o'clock in the morning. We get up and stir the fire up and have a wash and cook up some bacon and eggs and have a pot of coffee or a pot of tea. And then the head end brakeman would go to the service track to get the engine out, where the tail end brakeman he would he he would walk the train and make sure all the brakes were off it. Where the conductor, he'd be going to the office and getting the bills and the way bills for the, the trains. I'm Gus Langley. That's my nickname. It's not my proper name. I started in the 1945 when the railroad took on a lot of young fellows. They had a gang in the yard that was composed entirely of school children, uh, high school children, as track maintenance. Uh, there were there were a lot of trains in those days, far more than there are were today, and, and the track normally had to take a lot of maintenance. I started with a fellow by the name of Jasper Underhill. The, his shack was at New Street, up near William Street, and he went from the BX Tower west to just about Shedden, a 10-mile stretch. That was the normal routine for a section gang, was 10 miles of track. And they maintained it, uh, done everything there was. In those days, the track was, was really something. They used to keep the ballast in a straight line. There was, it didn't just go all over. It was, was made to be in a straight line. The weeds were cut, the, everything was cut. Um, looked more like a parkland than a railroad track. But eventually they just gave up on that because it became too expensive, I suppose. You never knew what was going to happen. Uh, the track would crack, was, would break in the cold weather. That has happened. And in the summertime when it got hot, it would expand. And if it didn't have some relief through the joints, if the joints were too tight, then the track would buckle and become unusable. So it was a kind of a battle all the time against the elements to keep the track running and keep it going. You know, when I was, had hired on as a signalman later, that was one of the things you'd get in the wintertime. You'd get a call in the middle of the night and there was a signal on, on uh, red and somewhere and you'd go out and you'd walk along and hopefully there'd be a moonlit night and you'd watch the track and you'd see the track glisten and then all of a sudden there'd be a black spot. And that would be where the track had, the had cracked. But it was hard physical labor. It was pick and shovel. There was no doubt about that. And then eventually we did get uh, the uh, compressed air machines that, that dug it. But basically, uh, most of my life was pick and shovel. Yeah. And I took his place on the gang. And I was on the gang from then, which was June of 1945, till I left in 1965, 20 years. I, I enjoyed that, but after I got married and had a family, my wife said, you know, wait till your father gets home means Friday unless there's a wreck. And she didn't care for that too much, so she rather leaned on me to leave, <laughs> so which I did. All right, I'm Jerry Cunningham. Uh, I was a technician for the uh, CN in the engineering department. And how I became an en a railway employee was a story in itself, in that I started off working for the Department of Highways when I left school as a draftsman. And when they were building the Ford plant at Oakville, we stayed in a motel in Oakville. And in the ne next unit to us was the railway engineer. And he had dinner with us one night, and he said, fellas, why don't you go down and try to get a job with the railroad? Well, you could make more money, which was the deciding factor. So off we went. He made an appointment for us to meet the chief engineer. And we went down in to uh, Toronto and uh, met with him. We met with him for about an hour, three, three of us. 
and uh, we talked about anything and everything except work. Finally, he threw a set of plans on the table and said, can you draw as good as this drawing? I said, yes. And the other two fellows said, yes. He said, all right. He said, I'll arrange for medicals and you, after you get your medical, we will either hire you or <laughs> send you on your way. I was the only one hired. And that was back in 1955. And I started off in the engineering office in Toronto. And I worked there for two and a half years. And the boss came to me one day and said, I'm going to have to lay you off at the end of the month. I said, OK, fine and dandy, no problem. A week before the end of the month come around, he called me into the office and he said, we've got a place for you to go. You can either go to Horn Payne, which is the end of the world. I didn't want to go there. Go to Montreal. I didn't want to go to Montreal because I couldn't speak French. Or he said, you can go to St. Thomas. Well, I'd never heard of St. Thomas before in my life. So I went home and I phoned my dad, who is a real railroad nut. He worked in construction, and at that time he was working on the St. Lawrence Seaway. So I told him my, my predicament. He said, well, I said, St. Thomas. He said, well, pack your bag and get down there right away. He said, that's the capital of the railway. I'm Mildred Moon, and I live in Elgin Manor now. But I did live in St. Thomas, and um, the old Allen P.S. ran behind our house from London to Port Stanley, and uh, we heard it go by every day, two or three times when it was running. I was uh, at, at um, London going to normal school, and wanted to go to a dance in Port Stanley when one of the big bands came. And uh, so I called a friend who was working in London and we went to Port Stanley on the train at night and saw one of the big bands there. I'm not sure now what the name was, but we were there. <laughs> and we uh, enjoyed the uh, dance at Port Stanley. and. Uh, came back at midnight to London. My name is Arlen Hartford. I'm a operating engineer, and I was hired by Tom McCattrell to work in the powerhouse as assistant chief engineer. And as such, I worked days on one day a week. I worked two night shifts, two afternoon shifts, and a day shift. And in our powerhouse, we had some large boilers, two quite old chain grate Leonard boilers that were naturally were fed with natural draft. And then we had a, a newer boiler, a big 500 horsepower combustion engineering Stoker Fire um, water tube boiler. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, reason for the boilers was to provide steam heat through all the buildings, including the station on the other side of the tracks. And we had in the powerhouse, we had a cordless horizontal steam engine that operated a, 40, a 400 kilowatt, um, 25 cycle, kilo, uh, 400 kilowatt generator. And during that time, it was when they changed from 25 cycle, 60 cycle. And the buildings here were changed starting at the west and coming east. They would take the electric motors all down and put on the 26 and the 60 cycle. And they came eastward through the plants. And at that time, the roundhouse was still uh, open and operating. So they, all the buildings were here at that time. 
And uh, <clears throat> so we've uh, operated the the generator during the day and provided 25 cycle. And as they moved through the buildings, changed to 60 cycle. And that was a couple of years at least. When I was hired from London as an as the operating engineer to work for Sterling Fuels in Port Stanley, uh, at that time, Joe McManus had started Sterling Fuels. He had just taken over the old shell plant on the west side of the harbor there. And we used to have ships coming in from Sarnia, particularly. I think there was some coming from Montreal, too, with heavy crude oil. And during my time there in Port Stanley, uh, it was there were a railroad track back into the, in the west side of the the uh, dock, the, the the creek, and coal was loaded in rail cars with a with a steam crane at that time, and because my friend worked on it, Huey Hyatt, and anyway. They were shipped out of there into London, wherever, and uh, and Bunkerall was also shipped out of Port Stanley by rail. So there was quite a bit of connection there with coal with, on both sides of the creek. I'm Ron Barham, and I work at the Alton County Railway Museum as a volunteer. I have never worked for uh, pay on a railroad, but uh, various members of my family did, including my father. He uh, apparently had connections with three railroads from what I learned from the tape. One was the Pier Marquette, where he was more of the time, but he also worked in the shop right here in the New York Central shop. And he tried to, he applied for a job on the uh, New, uh, Canadian National in the north end of town. He was trained as a machinist, but a lot of the time he had to do other jobs that were required around there. If running a machinist is running a lathe, um, we have examples of them in our building now. <clears throat> and I believe he was working on an ordinary size lathe, not one of the huge wheel lathes that was uh, quite large. So I was always keen on railroad locomotives and trains of all sorts. And we certainly saw a lot through St. Thomas with all the railroads that ran through here. By 1945 or so, they were still six major railroads running through here. It was natural that when I retired and moved back here in 1986 that I would uh, jump at the opportunity to, to work on the tourist railroad, the Port Stanley Terminal Rail. And uh, I went to their first meeting and I was introduced around as somebody was going to help them out. And I thought, oh, I'm going to be the big helper. No, that wasn't the case, no. I was just a volunteer conductor. A bit of history of the museum start with, uh, I, I understand there are several men who were, in many cases, former railroaders, but a few who were not, who were keen on having some kind of a railroad museum here in St. Thomas, since so many uh, railroads had run through this city. Well, I was, uh, <laughs> I guess I started out uh, being the one who called up people for the meetings to remind them of meetings. That was back in the early days. Um, I became the president in 2007 and uh, stayed for about uh, three and a half years, uh, replaced by George McNally, who unfortunately died unexpectedly the next spring. So I went back into harness for a little while until about August of uh, 2013, when we have a, finally a younger person who has more energy and ideas than I ever did. And, I think that's what's really turning the museum around quite well.